welcome to the Spiritual Phoenix Podcast. I'm your host, Ross Cessna, and I bring you a weekly podcast about alchemy, spirituality, magic, mysticism, and more. Please leave us a five-star review on iTunes, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and like our videos. Welcome everybody. We are joined with Shauna Sudik today. Shauna, how are you doing? I'm doing amazing. It's January in Cleveland and well, almost January in Cleveland and I think it's like 50 degrees outside today. So Yeah, it's unseasonably warm. I went for a hike yesterday um, in Braxville and it was like super chilly and then today it's warm. I'm like, Damn. Where in Braxville? Um, it was some meetup group. I don't remember the mm. specific location of it. I just go places, put it in my GPS yeah. and go. I was thinking the hike sounds nice recently. Just like it's getting sweaty, you know what I mean? In winter we get so like nestled and cold and under the blankets, it's time to sweat a little. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, my whole past week I've been very uh, in this like hibernative mode, just kind of resting up from running myself so ragged, but I'm also at this point where if I don't exercise enough and get enough movement and like burn off stress, it becomes paralyzing. So it's kind of being trapped between this resting but also realizing if I rest too long I'm gonna like be chased by <laughs> by like stress I guess so I don't know and the rest monsters yeah <laughs> it really yeah it is the rest monsters dude I've really come to this mindset of, of I'm going to be exhausted either from doing the right thing or from doing the wrong thing for myself personally yes. so like it's unavoidable so it's a matter of making decisions that give me my best quality of life and it's a lot more empowering to be exhausted from doing what I want to do rather yeah. than making excuses for not doing it. That hit me really hard recently. I I was talking, it might have been on a live video, but I came to the conclusion in the short statement, something along the lines of, um, you'll either be uncomfortable not making the change or you'll be uncomfortable making the change. It's just like you're not going to get out of it, so why not be uncomfortable making the change and feel better when you're not in the action of making the changes. Absolutely, yeah, my whole life is predicated on that same concept of being like afraid of moving forward and afraid of staying the same. And so like going with something different, but like I'll forget that at times. Where I'm like, this is incredibly comfortable. Let me cling to this little tree branch in this raging river and like <laughs> drown myself rather than let go and see what happens. It's a cyclical, um so I do cyclical ketosis. Do you know what that is? I'm not familiar with what that is. Um, it's just like a, a lifestyle diet um, way of eating. And it's it's a cyclical type of diet to where, um, the simplest put, it's very low natural carb for an extended amount of time, which puts your body in a state of ketosis, which burns fat for fuel instead of needing carbs for fuel. So this is better for the body as a whole majorly and then after me as a woman um two days out of the week i'll hop out of that cycle and just like carb load and then hop back into the cycle but i feel like with what we're talking about it reminds me it's like burnout Mm. like you work and work and work and work and you don't give yourself a break to readjust and recalibrate and you just burn out and so if somebody goes into a state of ketosis for too long that's going to burn out the body, just like if somebody goes into a work mode or a sleep mode or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's so, um, everything is just so cyclical. It, we might as well work with our rhythms. Absolutely, yeah. Rhythm and like harmony in my life is a big thing. I, I try to strive for balance for a very long time, but it's very unnatural to it's, have anything in balance. It's a weird word. And harmony makes so much more sense because it's like all of the different um, rests and... Uh, stress points in a song like culminate in harmony and like if you look at it in a a long enough period there's balance like i'm of the mindset that balance is sustained harmony it's not something achievable in and of itself it's a byproduct of finding the harmony in your life so kind of like what you're saying within this cyclical like honoring the cycle of that over a long enough period of time it's in balance with itself totally um i like the way you put it it reminds me of like um, the image in my head is balance is is the bird's eye view of harmony. Mm, right? Absolutely, yeah. You know the um, <clears throat> yin yang symbol mm-hmm. symbolizes an actual moving piece. I didn't know that that, that symbolized movement, but like 
conceptualizing it in my mind right now. You can see, I can see the movement in it. Yeah, so it moves how you would think that it would move, and then it moves in and out of each other. It's called a torus. And um, where was I going with this? Oh, you said something about music being harmony. Is that what you said? Yeah, like finding harmony in music. Like it's a lot better to look at your life like a symphony. Yeah. I was listening to, uh, was it Alan Watts, a YouTube one day, just something short, and he was talking about life like music, and I was thinking about how, like, if when you listen to an album or you listen to a song, there's always, like, a lull, and it's the lull is normally right before, like, the really good part, or the shit song on the album is normally right before the really good song, but all together they make this great story, and it's like, why can't we approach life like music to where if we're in a quote unquote shit moment we know that this awesome thing is going to happen and we get when that mom moment comes in music like when that lull shows up it almost creates for me it almost creates like this excitement and I was like ooh, it's about to come so in integrating that in with my daily actions and my emotional stability really makes me helps me to um understand that things pass we're not in our emotions Absolutely. forever yeah understanding that everything's transient and that it's like like weather or whatever and just letting it kind of go through it's natural again like that cycle of everything there's always like a season for everything i like that you mentioned alan watts too um he's somebody who's really shifted my paradigm in a large way and i like it that he approaches stuff in like a very humorous um and lively sort of way have you ever read any of his books though i haven't i have one called uh, the Way of Zen or something along the lines, but no, I haven't read it. I have one of his books, and I started reading it. It is the most atrocious piece of literature I've ever read, and, like, I'm so <laughs> disgusted by it. But, like, I love his lectures. Yeah. He's a horrible person to read from, from the is one he? book I've read. From the book that I've read, I would say that. Um, he speaks so fluently. Some people are better conversationalists than they are at writing, yeah. I feel like. Um, and this is coming from somebody who's incredibly pretentious, like myself. Like, reading his work is incredibly pretentious and, like, haughty. And I'm just like, I don't want to read this, dude. <laughs> yeah, Alan Watts, um, I got introduced to him through audio, obviously. And uh, he was so... I remember when I first... It was probably 2011 when I first really started listening to him. And... Um, if you guys don't know who he is, he's, would you consider him just a philosopher and a speaker? Yeah, like a, a Buddhist or Taoist um, philosopher, but he also, he's very, uh, yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah, it's a good, a good simple term. He, um, he explains consciousness in these, in these visual, tactile ways, and when I first started listening to him, um, I was like, who is this, who is this freak? Like, who is this guy? What is he talking about? What kind of reality does he live in? And now, listening to him as the time has passed, it's like, man, I resonate a lot with what he says and can understand the language. And I think it's so funny uh, being in any kind of developmental, self-developmental, spiritual work, how it's just a, it's a, just a different language. Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't know the language, speaking to somebody about it is not going to make sense. It's like you're talking Spanish to them. Um, yeah, so Alan Watts reminded me of that because he used to seem so crazy and now I appreciate his thoughts. Yeah, he speaks very symbolically and I think that that makes it very accessible to people in some ways, but you also kind of have to make this um, cognitive leap from terrestrial world to like his realm of symbolism and like dive into it. But like once you start to um, digest how he expresses things, it, it really does make a lot more sense and you can uh, integrate these very complex concepts in very simple ways in my experience totally if you if you like um in the context of a let's call it a full speech of his in the beginning and still now I'll, i won't just look at the whole thing and try to understand the whole thing mm -hmm. if you're looking at like little like oh that sentence let me sit on that sentence while he talks for a second and see if i can differentiate what he's trying to say and then you pick up another sentence and then it's just sort of becomes something that, that's easier to do and um something else just came in my head when you said that it's gone i have that effect on people they're like <laughs> oh but no <laughs> um so explain who you are because I, I always let people explain who they are because i'll butcher it all right i um my name is shauna sudik 
and I'm an emergence coach. So this is like my style of life coaching, although I'm not a huge fan of the term. Um, I work with people specifically who I like to call counterfeit people. And so like counterfeit money, if we think of counterfeit money, it's like, okay, it looks real. It feels right, but there's something kind of off. And if you use the counterfeit money to, for too much value or you use it too much, eventually you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Can I swear? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I swear all the time. Um, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. And so counterfeit people are people who, just like counterfeit money, they're off. They're not themselves. They're not real. They're not authentic. They're made from what they think they should be made out of, but they actually aren't their real thing. So they aren't acting in congruence to what their soul wants. They're living for other people. And most of the time when I work with people, it's going, to, they're finally realizing that they are the common denominator in all the areas of their life that aren't being shown to them the way they wish it was. They're starting to understand <laughs> their words have power. They're starting to understand their thoughts have power. They're starting to step into spirituality. And so the term emergence for me came through pretty clearly and it symbolizes that, like, you don't, nobody needs a coach. You know, nobody needs anything. You have everything that you have already, and it's just up to you to take responsibility for letting that emerge from you rather than looking for outside sources to, to piece you together. And so it's a funny paradigm because a lot of coaches will say, well, I'll help you do this, but you really don't need me. And, um, I've been doing it now for about six months, officially. I have a meetup here in Cleveland called Effective Lifestyle Community that we do workshops and meetups every once in a while. And then I work with clients from all over. Um, I'd say three of the main areas that I work with the most are gonna be mind, body, uh, personal power, and self-expression. And so I love anything communication. I love words. I love effective and nonviolent communication. And a little bit of my history has um, a lot to do with all of mind, body, self-expression, and personal power. And I've had a history of you. I could say you could say I've had a history of abusive relationships. Um, I could probably find better language for that, but it these relationships took me to a place to where I realized that I would I could take responsibility for staying in these abusive relationships so they actually brought me to a place of power and that was after all of the things and rape and manipulation and then after I got out of those relationships and I leveled up in my personal power I actually still had a lot of unresolved issues so I ended up getting sick and diagnosed with Crohn's disease which is an um, deathly debilitating autoimmune disorder from the gut, which is very interesting because the gut symbolizes personal power. Mm -hmm. And throughout, to make a long story short, throughout the course of, so 2015, 16, 17, throughout the course of three years, I almost died twice from the disease. And um, the second time was the worst, and then I had this experience to where I'm sitting on the couch taking 50 pills three times a day I'm 27 at the time and it hit me that I was dying and I was like no, no fuck this like I'm not I'm not ready to not be human I'm not ready to die I I'm not scared of it but I'm not ready for it and so since that day it's just been like these tiny little quantum leaps tiny little steps mm. since then and I just have to share the message of of life and how to create your life the way you want it to because I believe that the infinite is possible for each of us. Absolutely. I forgot to tell you when you swear that you have to give me a quarter for every time you swear because that's how I fund this podcast. No. I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> um, I resonate with a lot of what you said. Like for me personally, um, I'm not going to get into all of my story now because it's, it's redundant at this point doing it on my own podcast. But like you can highlight for me because I don't know it. I, I can tell you after two. Okay. Um, but like the toxic relationship thing, I can really relate to. Um, for me, I've been both sides of that coin. Also, uh, I do life coaching myself. Um, I like that you have your own term for it because I kind of to be like a very watered down term. And a lot of people that are doing that 
they just have a certificate in it. They don't have any practical application of it, and I find it completely um, ignorant. Yeah, disgusting. Yeah, yeah <laughs> ignorant is probably a more polite word. Yeah. Um, but it's just disgusting to me because there's no real understanding of actually changing their life in any major way. They just paid somebody to tell them that they have this title. Totally. Rather than having a life experience, you mean? For, for sure. And, like, my experience in a nutshell is being a, uh, going from being a psychotic, recluse, drug addict <laughs> to, like, being relatively well-adjusted and functional and happy and, like, quitting cigarettes. Like, all, like, a complete revolution of my way of being. So there's a lot more practical application than... I got this certificate, come let me help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, I really completely agree, too, that it's something, understanding that anybody ha naturally has this power, but it's um, kind of keeping them on path to achieving it because certain times it's really about who you surround yourself with, and sometimes people are so entrenched in negative people that they can't be there. And th the thing isn't that they're necessarily paying for the service. It's for the time more so than anything I would view it as because, like... I don't have time to help everybody, and I'd like to help everybody. I actually help people for free and other things that I do, and this allows me to help other people. So it's almost like, I want to say charity. This podcast? Not this podcast, but like doing life coaching or whatever okay. in general. And I'm sure it's kind of the same way for you, where the money is helpful, but you still kind of try to carry that message to people regardless. Uh, yes and no, actually. So I found... So the meetup, Effective Lifestyle Community, uh, most of those are free. I do have some paid little workshops that I plan on growing. And then as far as spreading the message, um, and for me that message is possibility, that message is, is um, following our soul, following our purpose. And our purpose can look like many different missions because I think a lot of people get caught up, well, if I say this is my mission, I have to be married to it, and I don't believe that at all. And I find that by me spreading the message, and that's anywhere I go, the message is being spread with my being, mm -hmm. right? So I it's in my intention totally to hold myself and my thoughts and not... Uh, uh, take part in conversation or, or hanging out with the people that just don't match. So that is something that I take all the time and I give it freely and I love it and I love giving it and I love especially when people receive it, right? Because so you'll feel like people deflect and then eventually they'll receive and you're like, fuck yes, like hell yes to you. 75 and, cents. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quarters, please. Um, and I also found that so I've worked with some higher level coaches mm -hmm. and I found that when it comes down to money when it comes down to payment money is an energy money is a frequency it is currency and so if I if you come to me and you're having issues with something and you want to change something and I give you free advice you are way less um, probable to actually take that advice and run with it than if you paid me for it. It makes like a commitment on like a deeper level. It's an actual energetic exchange. And what if you paid $5 for advice or you paid $200 for advice, that's a difference too. So I find the more... Um, a w <laughs> so... With my private coaching and some of the retreats that I plan on hosting, I am calling forward the people that are ready with the price point. I'm calling forward, and I'm not, I'm not only calling forward that, but most of the time it's making them uncomfortable. Hmm. And so when they pay something that's uncomfortable, just like I did, like I didn't, I just took a course that was $6,000. I didn't know where the money was coming from. It was really uncomfortable for me, but that creates the space for growth. And so if my mission is truly possibility and my mission is truly um, about spreading this message of following your soul, it's understanding that you will be supported in these stretches that you take and understanding that people will listen and do more work and then by proxy touch more people if they pay. And so I actually don't... Um, 
do too much free coaching. See, here's what here's where I'm going to differ because if you live that lifestyle and you and you're embodying it, you are doing free coaching, but it's not directly. Yeah, that's why it's kind of both because like in my being, like I'm not going to not have a conversation, absolutely, but to have to to consistently do that for free, um, I don't think is exactly what everybody needs because they can get that's the information on Google. Too. That's self-abuse if you do it, if you're not getting anything back. If it's just somebody who's consistently being stagnant and not doing the right thing, mm -hmm. that's harming you. So, yeah. Yeah. And anybody can find anything online. Mm -hmm. um, you could find any advice you need is on Google and you can listen to it and it's going to work for you if you listen to it and take the action. Um, I And again, that's my experience because mm -hmm. I know I don't really take free advice I don't it's like paying for Planet Fitness ten dollars a month like I'm gonna show up when I feel a little motivated to go rather than paying more for a gym it's like I'm paying for this I might as well get my value out of it that makes sense I'm kind of I guess I'm different in that sense but everybody's different and it, it, it's all relative totally and people who some people do really well with some people get free coaching and it changes their life mm -hmm. you know um, and I don't, people are all doing it their own way. You know what I mean? There's no right way or wrong way. It's just whatever feels right. Yeah. I guess when I look at it too, though, my, my, my coaching, like I didn't pay for it and like monetary stuff, but I paid for it through suffering and like misery and like being like, I can't live how I was living. <laughs> so I have to change my freaking life. Me and then too, it's like self-teaching. So like. And I shouldn't say self-teaching, but getting involved in a 12-step program and, like, having a lot of mentors that gave it back just because they got it that way. So it's similar but different. But at the same time, I can't translate that information to everybody else. So, Translate what information? 12-step um, recovery, some of the benefits of that. Like, I can't translate it to everybody. Okay. So I guess that, like, that's where money would come in, into my whole process of everything would be having to translate it into more realistic terms for for john q public right right yeah. <laughs> um i totally feel you on the training with suffering and i'm i'm right there and that sort of reminds me back to people who are just getting certificates just because they want you know a job and um although i believe everybody has the potential and everybody has the knowledge and everybody can tap in there's still like if you are somebody looking for coaching you want to find somebody that has gone through and gotten four steps ahead of where you are. Mm -hmm. Like, make sure that they know what they're doing because a lot of them do have life experience. You know? Yeah, everybody has life experience, really. But it's, is it what you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This brings me to like to uh, the counterfeit people thing. Like that. That's like kind of comes back to my mind because I like how you use that term, and it's definitely something that like I feel. Um, just using myself as an example, because I'm the best example I have without judging other people. Like, for me, it was like, if I do this, like, am I people-y enough? Am I a, enough of a person? Like, especially in regards to, like, dating. So if I hit all of these check marks, check marks or, or boxes, that makes me, like, a good person to date, right? And it's, like, completely inorganic, and it's very artificial and robotic. And then, like, going through life, if I have this job, or if I do this, or if I act this way... I should be socially acceptable or like whatever it is and it's it's exhausting like what are your experiences with that personally with feeling like a counterfeit person or dealing with them in in, oh, in your yeah. life either or so I like what you said um, especially when it comes down to dating cause it's like there's these there's like a checklist it's like oh okay I got all of these things on the checklist what is happening? Why isn't it working? Or with a job, like with anything, they're all pretty much the same, right? Um, for me, so counterfeit people is my translation of people pleasing. Have mm -hmm. you heard that term? Oh, yeah, I've sure. learned that term. Yeah. <laughs> um, everybody <laughs> says that. Um, so people pleasing um, is just that. And it's not following what you want, not follow it's it's keeping everybody else happy but yourself. And so I don't like I hate the term people pleasing. I don't like it. Um I do my best not to use it, although it's good people understand the language, so I will. And people pleasing for me, I don't we might have had this conversation shortly. Um people pleasing for me 
is another way to say that you, if you identify as a people pleaser, I'm telling you right now that you identify as a manipulator. And mm -hmm. when we look at people pleasing, it's, I like to explain it as a heart centered manipulation because you want people to like you. You want people to have a good time. You don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Um, and the opposite side, the opposite end of that, um, and maybe this isn't the best term, but we could call it narcissistic. And so this is like a self-centered manipulation because I want this for me. I want to feel good. Me, 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 I, I. Mm -hmm. And so you see the difference there? And so the people-pleasing, heart-centered manipulators, a lot of people have a really hard time hearing this because they're like, what? Like, I'm not, a, I'm doing this for them. Like, I'm not a manipulator at all. I'm putting myself last. Like, I just don't want to get yelled at or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, when we are not speaking our truths, when we are putting ourselves before other people to make them like us, or when we are putting ourselves into suffering to make somebody else feel better, let just hear that. So let's talk about putting ourselves into suffering to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to like look this way. You're fine. To make other people feel better. So I am going to feel bad so Ross feels good. Mm -hmm. This energetically, we are giving other people permission to do the same thing. So anything that we do gives other people permission to do the same. So if I go out and I make a million dollars tomorrow, that's going to give whoever listening the permission and the knowledge to know that they can go do that. And so when we look at the world as energy, we're just getting everything that we're giving, right? It's one of the natural laws. And so if I'm putting myself in a state of disease to please somebody, you better fucking believe that those people are now going to put themselves or more likely to put themselves in a place of disease to please somebody else. So really, you're not making them happy. You're just giving them their permission to not speak their truth. And when it comes down to faking how we are and who we be and what we say for people to like us, we are not showing our true selves. And so if I, again, fake about my interests and my likes and my values to Ross, he doesn't like me. Or if I don't... <laughs> like, do I don't like you? Maybe I don't. Sorry. <laughs> um, did I explain that all right? No, I completely get it. No, I completely get it. Um, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> you got like a dollar twenty-five. <laughs> um... <laughs> Like, so they just slip. I can't. I get in the zone. Uh, I, I really, this really is challenging to hear, but so needed to hear, especially when it comes to loved ones and family. Because if you are pleasing your family to get them to like you, your parents, your children, your grandparents, your aunt, I don't care who it is, they don't love you. Like, don't, don't you want to give them a chance to love who you are? And... Let's say that you speak your truth. You say, you're, you're, you talk responsibly, right? We're not blaming. If we speak responsibly and we talk our soul, about what's on our soul and we follow our mission and this doesn't align with the people around us and those connections um, break, yeah, that, that might be painful. You might get to go through a process there and that is breaking so you'll have people show up in your space that are going to love you deeper and love you more and understand you better and so to bring this back around um counterfeit people is just that because after a while you're going to get in some deep deep shit if you keep being a counterfeit person and it will come back just like it did for me with disease and if i could go very deep here um I don't want to call it graphic, but it, it has to do with some sexual abuse, so I wouldn't say this is family friendly. But uh, I noticed, I look back on memories once I started doing this work, and I didn't notice it at the time, but I was uh, my first long-term boyfriend. I was 19. We had been dating. And through some events, something happened, and one night, a rape happened, and he, he raped me. So... To, without getting into the details, it wasn't anything super violent. Um, we initiated it together. I wanted to stop, and he didn't. 
And so I, about three years ago, maybe less, look, with looking back and I'm redefining my history to sort of give me this permission to move into my future. And I'm looking back at this moment and we're at his house. His parents were gone. And it was this moment of, okay, this is going to be really romantic. I'm doing this. We've been together for however long. And then this man, my boyfriend, the only person in the house, rapes me. And I get up. It, 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 it gets over with. And then I get up. I go to the bathroom. I, I'm trying to understand what's happening. I compose myself. I, I stop crying. I'm shaking. I stop shaking the best I can. I walk out of the bedroom, bathroom, and he's in the bedroom. And I sit down next to him on the bed, and he says some things. He was feeling guilty already. And he just did that. I just had that experience, and I stayed to console him. Mm. And I didn't leave to save my space. I didn't cry. I consoled him. I people... I, I like take people pleasing to the highest level that you can imagine it and that was me and what that led me that led me to other other sexual abuse that led me to other manipulation that led me to a lot down the next few years mm -hmm. which eventually led me to disease I have no doubt about it it's because I wasn't holding and standing in the power that I now know that I do have and I just looked and it was 111 on the screen hmm it's a cool synchronicity to have and like releasing that and kind of yeah. accepting it and like allowing yourself to experience and share with other people because I know that the more I share about the difficult times in my life the easier they become for me to like live through and the more that it helps other people as well because there's somebody who will identify happen. with it yeah yeah it's real life stuff rather than kind of um plastering over it and like acting like it never happened or just forget about it it allows you to live your story and it makes you less less of a counterfeit person. It makes you more real, the real you. Yeah. Because it's a real experience. Would you um, agree with the way that I described counterfeit person to people-pleasing? Does that make sense? Would you agree with that? How, how they're synonymous almost or what? Yeah, my explanation. No, I, I definitely, I've um, experienced that. And for me, like you talked about it being relative to family and stuff like that, or like th those are some of the people that we kind of do it to the most. In my experience, I was taught to people please by family at an early age, so it kind of goes into like the um, the perpetuation of it. And then now that like I've really worked on kind of um, separating from that mindset, I have a lot more di like genuine experiences with people, but there's a lot of people in my life that still live in that paradigm, and it's very. Uh, creates a lot of conflict because the more you set up boundaries for people that are used to tramp like trampling over your boundaries the more they're kind of kicking and screaming and it's frustrating and it like it's uncomfortable at times to really understand that sometimes me establishing my boundaries and being taught that I was wrong for doing so when I was younger and like wrong for establishing a boundary yeah yeah like yeah. That, that, you're like it's sometimes in my own personal life, I was told that, like, that was bad behavior, I was being bad, or I was being this or being that, or, like, shouldn't be angry, even though I'm angry. Yeah. And then looking at that and how much it fractured my personality and sent me on um, into mental illness and into addiction and into all of these different circumstances and not not blaming other people for it, like, taking responsibility for it because I have to take responsibility for all the stuff that I could control in my life. And for me, like, I could control how I responded to that situation because victim mentality doesn't serve anybody. Um, but, like, understanding my role in that, but also understanding that now that I have awareness of it, I have the ability to change it. It's exhausting and tricky, but it's also really liberating. And it's one of those things where I'm incredibly grateful for the experience of being a, a to use your term, counterfeit person. Like, because it's... Um, freed me up to like find out who I really am but at the same time there's still circumstances in my life um, where I fall back into that trap sometimes because it's so patterned and so conditioned and like understanding that the issues that I face now in life are relative to that but it's also something that I can't I don't want to say actively change like a lot of um, my life is like about allowing and accepting and things like that so it's like not beating myself up when I fall back into that. 
but like loving myself regardless and then allowing it to like naturally work itself out by saying, oh, that's cool, dude. I mean, you're only fucking yourself over when you do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, then be like, oh. <laughs> like, no, yeah, it's the, the critic is no good. I, um, I feel you on that because I think, especially with deep people pleasers that learned in their families, me too, like, it wasn't okay to be any emotional anyway you know what I mean mm-hmm. if I was too laughy I was high if I was too sad I shouldn't be sad if I was too angry I should compose myself like I totally get that and um you had to be counterfeit almost yeah be a robot yeah and I appreciate it and I think that you'll this dropped in I don't know what you said um first of all you must be doing something right because if you are used to be an addict and you've been sober like that alone so many people can't get so many people can't get out of that. Mm-hmm. So many people don't think it's even possible to get out of it. So you being that permission, like, obviously you've done something right along the way. Got my ass kicked just right. Just enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to say with if if you are somebody that feels like you're a counterfeit person, like you're a people pleaser, um, notice... Notice when you want to manipulate the situation for your or somebody else's benefit, and it's not true. Just notice. And one of the really cool things that I find and that I really enjoy and I'm diving into more and more every year is um, that this mind-body. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people call it the mind-body connection. Mm-hmm. And I, as much as that is kind of true, it's not because they are, they are one. They are synonymous. And um, when... Again, if you are somebody who identifies as a counterfeit person or see yourself taking on that role, um, I think you'll appreciate this. There's a there's a feeling in the body when we are not being authentic. Mm. There's something tactile. There's something heavy. There's something restrictive. And there's something there that we can tap into the more that we understand that we can tap into it. And so if we're having a conversation and we can let our body lead the conversation rather than our mind, letting our body lead is going to be leading authentically. Now that's under the context of speaking responsibly and not letting my body lead me into like blaming you or blaming somebody else or hitting, you know what I mean? We have urges, like we can not flow with those urges, but the the wisdom of the body to me, like moving forward in my life and moving towards my purpose and getting more clarity on that, it's all come back to the body mm-hmm. because I know what the body felt like with heavy disease. And so I, maybe I have a really good reference point there. Um, but spreading that message is really true because so many times we're in our head and then sometimes people will tell you to get into your heart. And it's like, well, what? I don't even understand. Like, that doesn't even, for me, it didn't even make sense. But that, to me, is like listening to this body of knowledge. Like, I have Alexand- the Library of Alexandra in my body, mm. plus so much more. And uh, we can tap into that at any time. And so when you're leading in a conversation and you want to be authentic and it's still uncomfortable, like, just start to learn to breathe and just stop for a second and listen to what feels light rather than what feels heavy. That makes sense. No, that's that's really really good advice, and I'm gonna respond to that. But first, I just want to take a quick break, um, and we'll dive right back in. Okay. Are you facing questions with no answers, or seeking an escape from persistent problems? Then enlist the Oracle at Mushin. The Oracle at Mushin provides high quality tarot and life coaching services at affordable prices quickly and easily book online with the link in our description. Our listeners get a 10% discount off the Oracle at Mushin's already low prices. Use code OFF10. That's O-F-F-1-0. Seek the solution today. All right, we are back. Um, so to kind of respond about like the body feel of everything and... Um, conversing from the body more so than the mind like I can definitely relate to the body feel because there's a different transition of kind of living in like what people would call the Tao like living in that Tao centeredness of 
of clarity or like the Zen state of mind where you're just living purely, I guess, and not kind of up in your anxiety and in your, uh, in your worry, your worry space. I don't know why I came out like <laughs> in your worry space, but like not living there. Um, my body feels vastly different and it's largely because of eating differently, like just completely changing Oh, diet, diet is, yo, diet is real. (laughs) But like, there is this sense of when you're, when you're speaking from the heart, body language is different, everything's different. I notice for me, like, if I'm not, if I'm like trying to say what people want to hear, I'm restricted, I'm like, in, like, closing myself off, I'm, I'm like consciously exhibiting signs of not wanting to do that. And I feel differently. One of the things that you said there that I I, I want to bring, like I want to touch on is you kind of talked about um, the body mind connection. Have you ever heard of the fact that consciousness is outside of us though? Or not the fact, but the concept that consciousness is outside of us. Um, Yeah. Like not consciousness isn't in the mind. Yeah. Like non-local consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, So it's like, is it, I mean, I definitely know that it impacts us, but Consciousness? It, yeah, yeah. Consciousness certainly impacts us, but is it really a part of the body? So the image that came to my head is the body. So I'm reading this book right now called Science of Mind. Mm-hmm. It's by Ernest Holmes. Do you know it? No, I'm just saying. Oh. I'm just like. It's one of the original books on that. It was written in the 80s, maybe. Uh, maybe it wasn't original book, but it's one of the older books that got OG. popular on it. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, he's. I don't have any quotes directly from it, but they talk about how the body... Okay. So we have this universal law of cause and effect. Mm. Um, And now we have this new paradigm coming from, like, Joe Dispenza. I don't know if you watch him. Sounds familiar, but I can't think of anything. He talks about... So we have this... It's like this Newtonian cause and effect... And so there's this new paradigm shift, which I believe is based off of ancient knowledge that talks about causing an effect rather than cause and effect. So it brings the power to us. And I feel like the body or like all material things, the table, the chair, whatever it is, um, is, and the body is always an effect. So the body is never a cause. So the cause would be these things outside. Is it ethereal? The cause would be these things outside of our body in other frequencies, right? And then just down, bear with me here, but down as the frequencies get lower and heavier and denser, we create our body based on our individual and collective consciousness. So I totally think that it's outside of the body. And I totally think that us as individuals have way more power over our body than we believe we do because the body is an effect, not a cause of our life. Hmm. No, I definitely resonate with that because if you think about it, if you picture a river, the lightest stuff floats on top, the heaviest, like the sediment and stuff like that, sinks to the bottom, and then you have all the shit at the bottom. <laughs> Not to say that the body's shit, but, <laughs> but like, um, in my own personal experience, understanding like, uh, there is a big like shift for me prior to like getting involved in everything, but looking at the uh, etymology of the word entertainment and it meaning to contain within, and start starting to like really understand that how I entertained myself was unhealthy for me and like understanding how that was like affecting my body and the choices that I made and like how I was literally programming myself to like pretty much be psychotic, like psychotic, a psychotic drug addict. Well, it's fun. You know what I mean? Drama is fun when you're in it. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it can be addictive um, in in its own right. Totally. Um, And like really looking at, that and then going through this whole process of now we're like I'm not on any medication even for my mental illness and most people awesome. are on that medication for the rest of their life um, especially with like the extremes that I've been through and being able to integrate back into society it's not relative to me being special it's relative to kind of this e- like conscious reprogramming and then it goes into like the soul element of things or, or spirit element of, of things, you know, like where did that come in into play? But it, I definitely think that consciousness impacts the body. I think that's without a doubt. And I think that people underplay that. And then people are very, um, people take too lightly how they entertain themselves or what they think or what they say or what they 
like what goes on up here, people take it too yeah. lightly and they try to suppress it. That's how you end up with addicts or people that watch the Kardashians or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Those are related. I can't say I've not done that, but it's never <sighs> maybe on a vacation. It is entertaining. Um, I mean, it's like rubbernecking in a car crash, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> let me try to merge out of that. Uh, you can just move on now, like I didn't say. That happens a lot when I talk to people. Um, oh, there was something you said. Entertainment. You were talking about entertainment, and then you were talking about what people say. So one thing that came up was, I think that consciousness, wherever it is, it's in the brain or if it's outside of us, I think that it communicates through, it does filter through, it filters through the brain, right? So our neural connections. It's like a wireless receiver. It's like the remote control of a remote control car or whatever. Um, Okay. So if you imagine, you know the Pink Floyd album cover? Which one? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Dark Side of the Moon? With the Yeah, with prison. the refractory thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, prison, yeah, that's what it's called, like you said. <laughs> <laughs> the refractory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, funny, because you said that, and I was like, oh, that sounds smarter than my word. No, yours is actually the right word. I'm just, like, talking about the concept. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> The prism, so you can call consciousness whatever the hell you want to call it. You can call it God, source, consciousness, wisdom, ancestors, like whatever your belief is. And that, let's, let's just imagine for a moment that that thing is white light. Mm-hmm. And white light is, is and can be everywhere. So that white light holding all the information, all of the knowledge, all of the personalities, all of the love, all of it all. And then we have a human. And um, my coach Brandon Bozarth talked about this pretty deeply. But each human is its own prism. And so if we imagine that each of us is a prism walking around And now remember that this light of source is on us all the time. This light of consciousness is on us all the time. And we're all expressing consciousness differently, right? You've had a different experience. I've had everybody's different. So if we're each our own prism, and we're each then showing a different spectrum of the light, okay, well, why? Right? How? And then how do we change? Like you and me, we've both changed so much. Like how do we then change the spectrum of light we see coming, showing through the prism. What colors are coming through? How many colors are coming through? And I believe that it, if you imagine a prism, just like a triangle, right? You don't have to imagine it 3D, but one side is our thoughts and beliefs. One side of that triangle is our emotions. And then the other side of that triangle is our actions. And so our emotions, beliefs and actions are all created from every single moment leading up to now Hmm. in each of our lives. And then by that prism that's slightly different and shaped the little kind of different shapes for everybody, we get a different personality construct that comes through. And so I believe that we can, if our thoughts create our emotions and our emotions create our actions and our actions create our results, awesome. So what do I have control over? My thoughts, my emotions, and my actions. Mm -hmm. And leading all the way back is to thoughts. And so somebody like you who had this personality construct of a a recluse addict, you were showing different colors and you were were picking up that consciousness that held everything, uh, everything that we know, all the health, all of it, and you were just showing this little dull little light. And so now you're reshaping this this prism through your thoughts and your aligned action and then it's showing more light and I just think that we all have that power and understanding that each of us individually have a different personality construct based off of our history 
And we can look back at our history to give us a new personality if we change what it means. Mm. Very cool. One of the things that, like, I, I like how you present it, but I always have to be, contra- not, maybe not contradictory, but like... Expansive. Yeah. I, I view it more so like, I like the prism analogy. I think that's a really cool way to look at it, but maybe it's more of like washing it off and making it more clear. Mm -hmm. than it is like reshaping it because I'm largely the same person I was before I kind of obstructed it with contradictory behavior to how I how I wanted to based upon kind of being this counterfeit person like let me try to shine my light this way because this is how I think it's supposed to look but then not knowing how to do it that way because I'm not made to shine that light so then I'm like getting all fucked up (laughs) yeah in like a prism sense and in a real life sense yeah and then I'm like I don't know what's going on. Like, I didn't do this shit. And then I fall into like, the victim mentality of it because I largely... I did, but I didn't. But then it's like kind of this whole concept of washing it, washing it away so it can be how it's supposed to be, how it originally was before life yeah. happened. I, I also want to touch on the fact that you said kind of thought creates action. I think that that's true for a certain point, but also there's like this... Um, What's the word I want, I'm looking for? Reverberation, where if you're not, if your action isn't creating your thought or feeding into it, it's not sustainable. So, like in regards to recovery, if I just say I want to quit getting high, right? But I don't put any action into changing my oh, life yeah. to not getting high, then I'm probably going to get high again. But like if I use that thought to create the action to stabilize that thought, so it's like this feedback loop. And it kind of goes back into like that tension and release of like this center point of duality or like whatever the fuck you want to call it. But I think it's like a mixture of both things. Absolutely. Like, I'm so glad you brought that up. I'm so glad because so many people get caught. They're like, well, I don't want to go to the gym or I don't want to. My thought, they always, so many people come back to that and they're like well I can't change my thoughts I'm having trouble changing my thoughts it's okay well you get to take action because action will change it. action breeds confidence and then mm-hmm. action will change it. I totally totally agree and I thank you so much for bringing that up because I tend to forget to place that into that conversation and it's so true because we, there, we have way more control like we are not our thoughts we aren't them they don't Absolutely. define us and our actions we can so with urges, let's talk like being an addict. Mm-hmm. There's this urge to do this thing that your values really don't want you to do, but your habits are there and you want to. And a lot of people, whether it comes to lifestyle change and like food or starting a new business or whatever, whatever the new next level for you is, um, there's urges that show up to the old paradigm of who we used to be and it reminds me like have you ever had the urge to punch somebody in the face i'm sure i have i can't recall it because i want to sound very noble but (laughs) (laughs) never good sir um you don't punch him in the face though right yeah i don't i don't think i have that normally i can either (laughs) confirm or deny this no (laughs) i mean we don't like i don't i have urges to to scream. I have urges to punch people in the face. I have urges to like honk my horn, crash my car, punch the wall. We don't do it because of our, because of our why and our values. And when it comes to the conversation around, well, I've never done it before or like, shit, I've been, how, how long were you an addict? From like 12 until I was 32. 20 years? Yeah, about, yeah. Um, like, should I've been at it for 20 years? Like, I've never been sober. I don't know how to be. Or I've never ate healthy or cooked. Or I've never started a business. Or I've never done whatever. Made a website. Like, I can't do it because I've never done it. You know, how many times? We hear that. They, they think they don't know. And it popped in, like, two days ago, actually. It popped in to me. And it's like, okay, well, do you believe that you're going to die? And I, I don't mean esoteric, I just mean as a human. Do you believe that you're going to... I am about to, like, wax <laughs> for you. No, uh, I'm pretty sure that that's supported scientifically. I, I don't have I don't have all the evidence to prove that I will. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. like, but I'm pretty sure, like, I have... I would bet on it. Yeah, and most people 
they know they're going to die. Because they've seen other people die, right? Yeah, I gave you a really weird answer. No, no, it's good. <laughs> I'd probably answer the same way. Um, <laughs> technically. Um, so if you know, you anybody, you, you listening, me, you know you're going to die. But wait a minute. You've never died before. So how do you know you're going to die? Because you see other people doing it. Like... Oh, you've never changed your life before? Like, okay, boo-hoo for a second, and then go look at the millions of other people that have done it. Because that excuse is such bullshit, and I'm so tired of hearing it, because it's so easy for us to find evidence. We believe we're going to die because we see evidence of it. I've never died. Like, I can't say anything about it other than the fact that I know I am because I see it. And whatever lays on that other side, if it's not death, like, I'll know then, but as a human, this body will perish. Just to play devil's advocate real quick, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry I'm going to bust up this, but like, which you are you referring to? Tangible body? Tangible human body. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, that other stuff is, uh, that could be a whole other conversation, I think. Um. <laughs> For sure. No, I, I see your point, though. It's like um, people want evidence, but the evidence is all around, so it's really just kind of being uh, attracted to a self-limiting belief of, not me and selling like selling themselves short really yeah or saying it's too hard or it's too difficult or i don't know how and it's like i'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't know how to fuck up your life like you did when you were yeah. <laughs> a kid but like you did a pretty good job of managing that i'm really good at getting crohn's disease I can do <laughs> right. yeah right i'm good at like ending up in psych wars <laughs> i didn't know how to do that before but yeah. like i managed like very intuitively <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny so how do you think um now, how long have you been sober? Um, over two years now. My clean date is uh, September 2nd of 2016. So you said September? Yeah. Okay. Um, looking back at your life as an addict, what can you think about that you now as yourself? I mean... I guess uh, everything the, really like what can I th thank them for yeah the biggest lessons the biggest um, obviously that happened to you because you had a certain lesson to learn you had a certain you have a certain theme for the mission that your purpose is facing if you fail long enough you'll succeed <laughs> <laughs> like I, I mean that like jokingly in like a tongue-in-cheek way but it's also really what it was like rock bottom gave me like the best motivation to succeed so, really, yeah, fail long enough and you'll succeed by, by default because probability is in your favor. Say that another way for me. Um, you learn to be successful by making mistakes. Oh, yeah. Fail forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, like, really on this big trip of listening to that, like, uh, Denzel Washington speech for a while. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I think I might have. Yeah, he talks largely about that, but he talks about how, like, if you don't fail, you're not even trying, and failure is like the prerequisite for success and all this stuff. And like looking back holistically, I learned so much from that experience. I'm not one of those people that's like, ah, I fucking hate drugs. I fucking love drugs. I'm just really bad at doing drugs. And it's like that experience was really uncomfortable, but I also have a lot of experience from that that can help a lot of other people. Like being psychotic, it was really unpleasant, but I wouldn't change that for the world. First off, it's like, I'm going to write a whole bunch of really good sci-fi books eventually. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, secondly, like, most people don't ever get to talk about being completely crazy and then, like, having their mind pieced back together because they're either too ashamed to talk about it or, like, it's just uncomfortable and they don't want to relive it because they fall back into fear. So, like, all of those different components make me who I am. And that's one of the things I hate about the New Age movement which uh, there's a lot of them um <laughs> one of them though is like uh stop living your story or whatever like let go of your story yeah. and i understand that maybe i'm misinterpreting what they mean by that but for me i'm like dude my story made me who i am and it's not about stop telling it it's about like understanding it with a different perspective and looking at it from a higher vantage point yeah i that used to bug me too and i don't think now I, in my perception, I don't think that they want us to stop telling our story, but telling it from a powerful place. 
like telling it from empowerment because it go, goes again to like energy if if we tell our story as a place of victim other people are going to identify and they'll be like oh i can't trust men either oh i can't control myself either oh i'm a lush too and then they'll, they'll just identify and that's what we're creating right but mm -hmm. if you tell you a story like that like a story like that empowered absolutely fucking lutely and we can our story, when I hear, because I, I love the word stories. I love when people talk about their story, like, in personal development. Um, that's one of my favorite things to talk about because we're speaking right now into our story. Mm -hmm. Like, I, the way that I'm speaking about my past, the way that I'm speaking about my future is based off of my story. And I, we, you, we can all change it in any second. And so when it comes to language, like, um, the phrase... Uh, let's talk it about I can't I can't blank that's just like a story right um, I shouldn't blank that's just a story it just goes back to like I can't build a, I don't know how to I can't build a website or I can't trust men let's say I can't trust men um, I'm not good in relationships <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good in relationships I can't lose weight like you're just affirming all of that based mm. off of the story that you're telling yourself about yourself. And it doesn't even have to do with your history. It has to do with right now and what you're saying right now to what you're speaking into. Because if you say you can't lose weight, well, guess what? Well, let me ask you this, though. Again, to play devil's advocate. So you're, you're about being, not being counterfeit. And this is one of the issues that I have with, like, the New Age thing where they tell you to, like, change your language in those aspects. Mm -hmm. But if you really believe that, don't you have to be honest with it and say it? And doesn't that lead to the transformation, though, too? Yeah, good question. So when it comes to affirm, Ooh, sorry. <gasps> sorry, people. Um, <laughs> She's in a rage now, people. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> uh, when it comes to affirm like affirmations, like, I am healthy and I am loved, and those are a little corny. And there's something called, I believe it's called an incantation. Well, that's actually, uh, that's not really what you asked. So. Oh, you're fine. Go with it anyhow. When it, I will, I'll come back. But in our language, like, uh, if it's like, I'm not good at relationships, let's say. A lot of people, relationships is a huge paradigm that's getting shifted right now. I just separated from a four-year relationship with a perfect man because my intuition told me to. Like, come the fuck on. Um. But if we say, like, okay, I'm not good at relationships, my relationships always end in heartbreak, um, I'm not easy to love, like, whatever sentence or statement comes up for you, we will feel like we're lying. Like, if we say, sometimes we will feel like we're lying if we say, all of my relationships flourish. And it, then there'll be that voice in the back of your head that's like, well, no, they don't. Like, who are you talking to? Who, who are you talking to? Exactly. And I think what I found and what works really well for me is if I can't, it's more generalized than that. So if I can't state something like, um, if I can't state something like I, all of my relationships flourish, right? Um, I can say something to the fact of I am committed to opening up to love. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, you like tr you transition it to something more realistic. Like I am learning to have healthy relationships. Right. Or, That's or way different than I can't have healthy. I don't have healthy. Like think of that. Think of I don't have healthy relationships. Like okay, you won't. Or if I'm learning to have healthy relationships, am I committed to? speaking my truth or I'm learning how, you know it's just it's so different and the, our words are so words is like language is like my thing and words are so quickly overlooked they're so quickly drawn as these bullets and when we think about creating our reality mm -hmm. like creating our life creating what our outside like our outside looks like not to neglect the inside, but creating what our life looks like. The words that we speak, the minute they roll off of our mouth, our frequency, you can feel it. Put your hand up to your mouth. Like you're creating your reality through the words you speak. And so it's really 
important for us all to take radical, radical responsibility. And when we're limiting words come up like can't, shouldn't, have to, like you don't have to do anything. The only thing you have to do is drink water. You get to do these things. You want to do these things. And I, I know that sometimes it's really challenging to say that you want to do something. But when we take a bird's eye view, like I changed my diet when took a full 180. Just like you love drugs, I love fast food. I mm, love Twizzlers. Me too. Like and shit. And drugs. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, and toxic relationships. Yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> oh, those are my jam. <laughs> <laughs> um... Switching a diet around, it's like, okay, there's this healthy food here. Do I want to eat it? Absolutely not. In this moment, I do not want to eat this food, right? This is what I'm telling myself. And am I eating it anyways? Yeah, I'm eating it anyways. So why am I eating it? Well, because I want that. I want that life. I want that body. I want that health. Okay, so I want to eat this. Like, sometimes it's not going to... Sometimes we can still speak into the mission and we can still speak into our values and it's going to feel kind of off but you'll know it's right when it also feels kind of empowering i think that's i think that, that definitely adds clarity to it so it kind of that falls in the middle of everything too though i feel yeah. like it's like a center point because there is some things that are incredibly hokey like i've heard people say like i have to say i am healed in the positive even though like their their left arm is falling off or whatever and it's like dude no you're not like <laughs> you're bleeding everywhere it's yeah. like you're not healed. And I think that that can be kind of a dangerous aspect of the New Age movement to where people avoid telling the truth rather than speaking what they want or what they're working towards or what they're trying to create. Right. It'd be like me telling you, like, yeah, I'm a millionaire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, with a thousand bucks in the bank. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like a misunderstanding of law of attraction and abracadabra and all of that kind yeah. of concept. I think that um, somebody asked a question on social media about Eastern and Western philosophy, and it, it is, it's the pairing, man. It's like the pairing of the, that masculine, divine masculine and divine feminine. It's not just all about the mind, it's not just all about our thoughts, and it's not just all about our body, and it's not just all about the materialistic. Mm -hmm. But it's like, so it's pairing it. It's, it is the harmonics between the two yeah it's like the alchemical wedding or the sacred union that's like in all these um traditions it's like the metaphor for that it really is combining all of these two parts of things and then having it be something greater than the sum of the parts totally which this is completely off topic i feel like i could talk to you for hours um, <laughs> but like did, did you know that like originally wedding bands were supposed to represent kind of the complete completion of the individual kind of that kind of Nobody. Eastern and oh Western. Oh my gosh, I love that. Yeah. Two individuals coming together? Yeah, that's what it was supposed to represent, and it was kind of watered down and lost all of its power. I don't know why that, that sprung to mind, but I thought that that was like a super powerful symbol. Yeah, it is. Because I, there's, there's some, I'm creating um, my own beliefs about marriage, and uh, there's some that I don't choose to identify with in our culture. And so that is, and I've always thought of it like two. The, the best kind of um, interdependent relationship rather than an independent or codependent is like these two beings who can fill their own cup and then water each other with that overflow. It's just like that. I wish they could see what my fingers are doing. Um, what is this called? Oh, I don't know. But Yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> a, know, the circles meet in the middle. You know, it's like you, ha you can't. Yeah, the overlapping. Yeah, yeah, you gotta love yourself first. That's so good. It's so good, and I think even before, like, marriage not even considered, like, before anything. It's it's you loving you, and that's that's your history, that's your future, that's your quirks, that's, like, everything. Mm hmm Yeah. So, I don't want to hold you hostage here all day. I feel like we'll have to do, like, a second interview, maybe, yeah. and touch on more stuff sometime. Like That would be great. Um, do you have any closing words that you want to take us out with? Also, thank you for, for making time for this, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for driving out here. Oh, no worries. I thought it was a two-hour drive. It will be round trip, just to make you feel guilty. <laughs> 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 um, last words, let me think. I 
it's too much pressure. No, I don't. If I had to just spread any message, it's going to be to really walk around um, and notice what you're saying. Record yourself. Just hit record. Talk to yourself for 10 minutes. Play it back and notice how you're getting exactly what the fuck you're talking about mm. and how you get to shift it. And um, I love you all. If you're in Cleveland, I have a, um, the meetup is called Effective Lifestyle Community. It's on the meetup app. And then um, I'm hosting a retreat January the third weekend. I think it's the 26th. It's called 24 Carat 2019. Um, I just posted that up on Facebook. And so I'd love to see you guys there. There's going to be um, a cacao ceremony. We're going to do a releasing ritual. I have my friend Allie Wilkins who is a abundance coach in from LA. She's going to hop online and do a quick little abundance tuning session with us plus a couple other cool things. Um, other than that, thank you guys for listening all the way through. Um, this is my first podcast ever. I'm so honored. So, uh, yeah. Um, thank you, Ross, for this too. Yeah, you're welcome. You're I'll put your work. links below. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. Please visit the links in the description below. You can support this podcast through PayPal, Patreon, Venmo, Anchor, or through our shop and services.